conversation is green building materials standards and certifications. Today, I'm excited to introduce our special guest, Anna Rock. Hannah was a lecturer in architecture and environmental studies at Washington University in St. Louis until mid 2020. She provides a deep focus on the environment, uh, environmental impact of building materials and architectural finishes, the regional nature of materials and their vernacular use. She's an active member of the Missouri Gateway chapter and um, board uh, and education committee, and she where she's where she has created several programs in architectural building materials. She has in-depth knowledge of the design process, decision-making, contracting, purchasing construction processes for large complex build buildings, such as hospitals and digital fabricate and fabrication facilities. Hannah received a master's of architecture degree from Washington University in St. Louis. A couple of guidelines before we get started. Uh, so the options to click the grid view is up in the right hand corner to see more callers. The chat function is available below if you'd like to in initiate in the conversation. Try to be respectful, respectful of others. Allow others to join in the conversation. Be mindful of not jumping over others uh, while others are speaking. But feel free to talk, uh, talk through without having to be called upon. But if you don't want to interrupt somebody but you have an idea, just use a little reaction button and I'll note it and then try to get you into the conversation at the next available moment. Try also to keep yourself muted unless speaking to avoid any background noise. And without further ado, Hannah. Um, good morning and thank you, Brandon, for the warm welcome. Um, I'm, uh, I, I apologize, but I'm gonna be reading my presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk fast. I'm gonna try to get over um, a fairly large amount of information. As Brandon said, today starts our summer calendar of coffee breaks, all focusing on building certifications. Similar but different, the book I co-authored covers green building materials. Can you put up our first slide, Freddie? Yes. Okay. With my presentation today, I wanna to set up a framework for the coming coffee break topics. Let's start by understanding the similarities and differences between building certifications and material standards within the world of environmental sustainability. One similarity is that both are voluntary. By this, I'm talking about the concept of mandatory versus voluntary. Building codes are mandatory or a law. Speed limits are mandatory and each can be enforced or regulated, usually with penalties. On the other hand, building certifications and green material standards are voluntary. Often we say that building codes describe the least bad building allowable, or that building codes describe the lowest allowable. In contrast, voluntary standards are aspirational and inspire great improvement over common practice and suggest great innovation. Unlike buildings, materials are certified to a particular standard. For example, carpet that has, been, that has earned the NSF 140 gold or the cradle to cradle silver label were certified to a standard. NSF 140 and cradle to cradle are standards. NSF and cradle to cradle are also standard development organizations. Perhaps you've heard of ANSI and ANSI standards. In order to be accepted as an ANSI standard, the standard development organization must be a consensus body and use the consensus development method. Both NSF 140 and Cradle to Cradle are ANSI standards. Oh, Freddie, I think you're getting a little ahead of us on the slides. Can you go back a little bit? Or maybe we can just all look at each other. Okay. At our last coffee break, Ty Newell, discuss the difficulty of decreasing allowable CO2 levels in the ASHRAE ventilation standard. A decrease would greatly enhance human health, the health of the building occupants. However, natural gas companies don't wanna see the CO2 levels reduced as it would eliminate all natural gas for cooking. And as ASHRAE is a consensus body, by definition, all stakeholders, including natural gas companies, must have a seat at the standard development table. So the effort to reduce CO2 levels may never pass. For this presentation, I also wanted to have a comparison of a consensus-based standard versus a proprietary standard. Proprietary standards are thought to be more stringent than consensus-based standards. The one I'm most familiar with is 
FSC versus SFI, the forestry standards. FSC, a proprietary standard, was developed by SCS, Scientific Certification Services. In reaction, SFI, a consensus standard, was later developed by the forestry industry. Though FSC and SFI are often believed to be equal, FSC has more stringent requirements for managing old growth forests. One last item before I leave the topic of mandatory versus voluntary standards. In 2018, green building leaders, the USGBC, the International Code Council, ASHRAE, and the Illumination Engineers Society joined forces to develop the standard version of a building certification, ASHRAE 189.1. It's titled, Standard for the Design of High Performance Green Buildings Except Low-Rise Residential Buildings. ASHRAE 189.1 is the technical basis for the 2018 International Green Construction Code, thus translating a voluntary building certification into a mandatory code. An editorial comment on my part, while this document is a major achievement, it has had very little adoption by jurisdictions across the country. The exception is the DOD for military installations. I want to digress for a minute and talk about the ISO, the International Standard Organization, headquartered in Switzerland. Testing methodologies referenced by criteria in the standards we are discussing are ISO standards. ANSI, ASHRAE, and ASTM are all official American members of the ISO and can therefore submit standards to the ISO for inclusion. In other words, the te testing methodologies used in these material standards are agreed upon international standards. Can we switch now to the um, this slide, Freddie, to the life cycle? There we go, thank you. Hannah, do we want to launch our poll real quick? Sure. Thank you. Brandon, thanks. Thanks, Freddie. That's a very interesting, um, those are very interesting results and it gives me a good idea of who we have um, on, on Zoom right now. Shall I continue? Yes, yes, thanks. Okay. So um, this is the LCA diagram. This diagram illustrates the stages of a material or a product's life or life cycle analysis, an LCA. This is cradle to grave. To evaluate the environmental impact of building materials, efforts have always focused on, upon measuring every input and output in the, life, in the life of a product, in a product. Is it possible to take the poll down now, Freddie? Um, you should be able to just um, exit um, oh. out of the box. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. I hope everyone else on Zoom understands that's how it works. To evaluate the environmental impact of building materials, Everest have focused upon measuring every input and output in the life of a product. LCAs calculate the inputs and outputs throughout the product's life and convert them into their impact on climate change and other indicators of damage to the ecosystem and human health. The stages of a materials, materials life cycle begin with resource supply or raw material sourcing, which includes extraction such as mining, harvesting, or um, acquiring recycled feedstock. Processing, manufacturing, distribution, product installation and use, 
and the landfill. Um, and then all the uh, transportation that happens in between. The inputs include energy, water, material ingredients, and the outputs include water, wa waste materials, airborne emissions, and energy recovery. And of course, this is all outlined by different ISO um, standards on how to do it. A final thought, my final thought on the materials life journey. This is, this is a linear diagram and it really describes our reality in 2021. Uh, Freddie, let's go to the next slide. Uh, sustainability initiatives and environmental impacts. Now let's dig deeper into the criteria that make up material standards. The categories for building materials include resource use, energy, water, emissions, toxicity in human health, and social accountability. I realize the text on this slide is very small, so I will read the sustainability initiatives and environmental impacts considered in the energy category. They are energy source, energy flow versus fuel, renewable energy, grid, on-site and exported, energy savings and efficiency, energy consumption, audits, energy efficiency, excess and potential energy, energy recovery, energy from waste and bioenergy from waste. So you have some idea of how in depth um, and how to such a very fine granular level, um, these are being measured. I think the underlying principle for this general topic was first described by Lord Kelvin in, 19, in 1883. He said, when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the stage of science, whatever the matter might be. And today we would say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. However, we do see exceptions in the social accountability or the human components. Social accountability, social justice, environmental justice or environmental racism. We do not have measuring methodologies or metrics, international units of measure for these quantities. Early attempts to address these human inputs include LEEDS pilot credits. Also the Living Building Challenges Just Label, which is a self-reporting tool. At this time, there is need for innovation and understanding um, and, and development of defining methodologies in order to develop standards in this area. Let's go to the next slide. In our research, we found four categories of criteria based on the type of testing methodologies used in a standard. We have quantitative criteria, um, Quantitative criteria can be calculated and products can be compared. There's relative quantitative criteria. Um, this type of calculation makes it impossible to compare. So for example, a 3% decrease in energy use over a three year term um, where no concrete numbers of the actual energy usage are disclosed. Qualitative criteria. While there may be benchmarks put in place or bans agreed upon in the future, the current manufacturing process is not evaluated through calculation. And finally, there's disclosure criteria. Disclosure can be one of the most difficult criteria to fulfill. Manufacturers must consider whether revealing information exposes trade secrets or proprietary formulations or processes. If a standard requires disclosure across the life cycle, Manufacturers may also find it difficult to gather their information from their suppliers. I'm gonna just zoom out a little bit and we're gonna um, talk about transparency. In NSF 140, the carpet standard was created in 2006. Soon other product standards quickly followed. By 2010, a certain amount of dissatisfaction with standards surfaced primarily because the certifications did not reveal how product performed against the standard. Was the manufacturing process very energy efficient? Did it recycle water? 
Also by 2012, great energy efficiencies had been achieved in building energy consumption, and the focus shifted to human health with the realization that people spent on average 90% of their lives inside buildings. Architects, engineers, and building owners pushed for detailed data beyond a certification. They wanted to know the chemical makeup of, our products, of the products being specified for their buildings. Considering disclosure criteria, it's easy to understand why this was so hard to find. Thus, HPDs, health product declarations were developed and concurrently environmental product declarations were also being requested. Both are voluntary self-reporting tools. This emphasis on transparency, I think somewhat replaced the interest in material certifications. Is this a stopping time? Do we have questions? Yeah, let's pause. Um, feel free to type in your questions in the chat box or just unmute yourself. That would be great. Um, I, I will point out there there is one other rating system that might address kind of environmental justice issues is the SEED um, system, the social, economic, and environmental design um, system. It's not widely used, but it's out there. Um, I'm not familiar with it, and I'd be very um, interested to see if what the metrics are that it uses. So, I'll put a link in the chat, Hannah. Thank you. You know, it's hard to find metrics that measure aspects of um, human inputs that work in Milwaukee as well as Mom Bay um, if you're going to, you know, have. Um, an ISO standard, um, an international standard. But, um, then David, go ahead, I had a question uh, when, when there's opportunity. Go ahead. Hey, uh, Hannah, thanks, uh, great job. Uh, it's, this is an extremely complicated topic from my perspective on it, as, a, as a contractor, specifier, uh, builder, and, um, you know, I'm always looking for kind of the simplest solution. And uh, I've always heard about just the equivalent of a nutrition label on products, uh, a simple, easy to read, big uh, calorie, calorie number right on top. Uh, um, wh where do you think, where do you think we're at with that? It, it, it starts to just get so complicated as to how to set a common metric. I mean, we, we struggle even in an energy model to take uh, gas usage, electric usage, water usage, and come up with a common BTU, you know, just a common unit of measure. Where, where, where do you think we're at with a, a, a product a, a, a nutrition label type type uh, well, representation? I, I, I love that you brought up the nutrition label as an example. And a nutrition label is really a data display. And if you don't have a doctor's recommendation, I mean, how many hours have I spent in a grocery store uh, comparing different products, looking at their nutrition label? You know, for somebody who has diabetes, you have certain um, uh, ranges and guidelines that your medical doctor tells you to follow. If you wanna lose weight, do you look at the fat content or do you look at the calories? Do you look at the size of the serving? Is fiber more important than calories? No one has given us um, uh, rule of thumb information on how to use the data available. And I think that's where we are right now with environmental product declarations and HPDs. We are drowning in data. Of everything I've seen and heard, and by the way, Paul, if I remember, I'll, I'll send you, Mark Bittman did a wonderful, my dream label on exactly this, um, idea. And he was just looking at food, trying to get to one number. Um, and it's, it's a, I use it as a teaching tool with students. The best, the, the best guideline I've seen um, was developed by Paula Melton and Kristen Ritchie and Anna Hickey Harness. Um, it's called the 12 product rules. And it's, um, it's still available through Building Green. And again, I can send you a link, but um, they say, if you order it by the ton, 
look at the embodied carbon. If you use it inside the building, look at your toxic chemicals. If you're using it on the outside of the building, don't worry about the VOCs and the toxic chemicals. For efficiencies, you know, is it, is it mechanical or is, there, is it flow? And it goes through the 12 different steps. And I think you really have to um, break it down that way. I don't, I don't, I can't see getting to one number. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna speed along. Um, if you could put up the timeline, I'm gonna speed through this. Um, as we were writing the book, it became apparent to me that the events of mainstream society paralleled environmentalist concerns and international events. In the time since World War II, the most significant discussions and documents concerning human rights um, happened at the UN. So in 1948, the UN General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and much of the language we use today um, to describe criteria of social justice can be found in that document. Again, it, it, it serves as a basis in some ways, just like the ISO serves as a basis for standards. Um, and then by the mid 1980s, uh, the Brooklyn Commission's definition for sustainability evolved, which was meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So they stated that it was absolutely impossible to, um, the, to separate the links between poverty, inequality, and environmental degradation that the two were so in, totally in, uh, linked. Um, I'm going to skip ahead because um, I think our time is short. If we could look at the, um, there we go, the circular economy. So where the conversations are today, what's, what's the newest new conversation? Um, it's, the, it's the concepts of restorative design, regenerative design, and the circular economy, or a true cradle to cradle product life. A circular economy is based on the principles of des designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. The three ways to transition toward a circular economy are consume less, consume better, and create systemic change. While restorative design and regenerative design are abstract concepts, in essence, they ask to eliminate all extractive activities and materials produced from extraction. So that includes um, all metals, rare earth minerals, all the fossil fuels. Just thinking about petroleum, all plastics, including vinyls, are produced from petroleum. Sorry about that. Also eliminating all trash, closing all landfills. And, um, you know, let's really be honest with ourselves. Only 3% of plastics worldwide today are recycled. So the circular economy is an aspirational goal and we are very far away from achieving it. So um, please, more questions or thoughts. You know, I, I, I'm still kind of going back to your comment that you had before about so much data that we have, like we have the data, but it's more like how we use it. And I have heard, you know, just in um, what are going to be the upcoming professions that are going to be important to our society. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not the, uh, but basically the, the professions that are gonna be super important are the ones that can then um, gather the data and interpret the information to be able to make sense of it. And I think that this is a perfect example. There's so much information that is out there. It's almost analysis paralysis. And how do you, how do you take that information and put it into 
an understandable way to be able to then move forward because there is so much. A absolutely, and, and it is paralyzing um, without a doubt. Um, at the same time, I think if we take a step back, um, there's such an urgency to reduce our CO2 emissions you know, in the next eight years. One of the things that I find interesting about the circular economy is they said the five key sectors that we must really redesign, think about totally and, and reduce all of their impacts. Four of them are building materials, <clears throat> cement, aluminum, steel, and plastics. Um, if we could, uh, if we could cut the CO2 emissions, um, we could cut it almost in half, or we could cut out, if we reduce these, I'm sorry, I'm, my brain's going, if we can re reduce significantly these four building materials um, by 2050, we could basically um, cut out all the emissions produced by the transportation sector. And I, I, the, the other thing, and, and it's, it's the unspoken word in the, in the building industry is we have to build less. You know, maybe the real challenge is sitting down with an owner on a prospective building and saying, let's keep the budget, but build 30 to 40% less. Let's give you a better building. Um, and we have to, you know, consume less. That's the direction we have to go in. That's such a counterintuitive concept though to our society, unfortunately. <laughs> it, it means jobs, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's everything, you know, real estate investment, it goes against everything. But if we, it's like, how seriously do we want to um, tackle these problems? And in, let me see, it was great. It's um, Ban Ki-moon at the UN in um, 2016 said, we have no plan B because we don't have a planet B. Um, it's, it's inconvenient, but it's our reality. And, it, and it's staggering because we think about what can we do, but there's so much building on the continent of Africa over the next 10 years about every 30 to 35 days on the continent of Africa, they will be building the equivalent of a Manhattan, New York. So think about the concrete, the cement production, the steel production, the aluminum production. Well, wow, that's, that's pretty staggering to think about the amount of construction that's going to be happening in Africa. And uh, Paul McKibben, the environmentalist says, you know, it's, it's no longer what I can do or you can do, but how do we get together really as a society with major governmental institutions and make changes? So I guess that would be, my next question would be what, what are the, I guess, what would be the important philosophies of building in Africa that, would want to, that we would want to make sure that they're adopting? And what are they really, what are they thinking about now? Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like, I don't know. I know that from a global like product uh, standpoint, Africa is, is the next um, area that companies are going to start to put manufacturing in place and trying to diverse, diversify themselves away from China and putting it into Africa. So that's not surprising to me to, um, now to like kind of connect those two things together that you're probably gonna have a lot more manufacturing facilities and unfortunately a lot of exploitation of workers because of it. And um, how, how do we ever um, prevent 
the warming of the atmosphere, you know, beyond um, beyond a melting point, if you'll excuse the expression. Um, I remember um, uh, President Obama um, addressed um, Greenbuild um, after after he had finished his presidency and. He, he was talking about um, he was talking about India and that we ought to take all our newest and best technology and give it to India and not have them go through the whole um, industrialized um, curve of, of building a society and gaining technology and that you know as a society we had to work really as grassroots efforts grassroots efforts kind of coming up in our society to get everybody on board, but the idea of whether dealing with India or Africa, really giving them our best technologies so that they don't make all the dirty mistakes or use all the dirty technologies in, in industrializing like we did. Or like we just saw China do. Exactly. I think one of the reasons China is really angry with us is because our development people several decades ago said, oh, just build up your end industry and then you'll kind of transition into this beautiful, clean society. But they didn't realize the price they were going to pay was this horrible, horrible pollution and degradation. Um, anyways. I don't know that they could have gotten there any other way, but. Um... Well, thank you, Hannah, so much for this conversation that we've had today. I know that we are at about time. So uh, I uh, did want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we are going to have a, a series of these uh, talks, these uh, coffee breaks uh, throughout the whole summer. And we will have, uh, it will be focused on uh, green uh, certifications. And we hope that you join our, our next uh, coffee break. Good to see everybody. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks. Enjoy, Thanks. enjoy the weekend. Yeah, Thanks, and Hannah, Freddie. congratulations on your book, Leanne. And yeah, Hannah, that's, that's awesome. really awesome and exciting. Thank you. We have a published author in our, in our midst. That's, that's nice. It's a real page turner. It's good if you have insomnia. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. That's yeah. absolutely true. Bye-bye, <laughs> guys.